wow, that was so professional. I, I'm not used to that. Uh, so first off, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I looked at the agenda and I saw what was going on in some of the other rooms and I was just like, wow, if I can just get five people in the room, I'll be happy. So you have exceeded my uh, expectations. So uh, I hope that uh, maybe I can uh, exceed yours. Um, so what we're going to do is, uh, you can see all that stuff about me. Um, we're going to talk about bots. Um, and I'll kind of state the case for bots, and then I'll actually weirdly tell you you shouldn't be building bots. And then I'll flip it around and say, no, you totally should. So it's going to be a very weird uh, conversation, but we'll get through it. We'll also talk about why now. Um, I'm sure that all of you have started hearing of the hype and the buzz around bots, and you're probably wondering to yourself, Hey, why should I even care, and how do, we, how do we go about thinking about them? So we'll talk about how we design bots. So if you're a designer, um, I think you'll find some value there. Um, if you are a developer, um, we'll talk about how you build for bots. Um, and then finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to give you a little bit of inspiration and encouragement um, when, you, uh, leave, when you leave today. And we'll talk about sort of where do we go from the where we're at today. So let's talk about bots. So when you see a bot, it's typically where you have someone, no, oh, God, no, no, no. Oh, this, this can't be happening, really? No. We're not going to accept that. No, Clippy's not coming back. So just in case you were wondering, I've talked to the powers that be at Microsoft, and I've said, please, whatever you do, don't bring Clippy back. And they've promised me. So I'm just going to let you know that. And if it, someday Clippy rears its ugly head like that again, I'll throw this computer out the window. So bots. What bots are about is how can we have these kind of conversational exchanges with the apps and the websites and the things that we build. Um, you can see here, this is kind of a pretty typical one, right? Where, hey, I am you know, going to uh, get a haircut on Saturday. This bot tells me what times those that, that, that are available for my haircut. And then what it does is it confirms when I say, hey, 1030 sounds um, fairly good. This is kind of the typical expectation of what a bot is. It's something where, hey, you, you through conversation, ask it something, and then it responds back to you and kind of helps to move along the conversation. Now, the interesting thing is there's these bots that exist out there today. Um, so one bot that's been very interesting um, has been this bot that was created by this 19-year-old, uh, I believe out of the, the UK. Um, and what he did was he basically said, hey, I think it'd be interesting to build a, a bot, but I wanted to actually do something. And so what it actually did was it, he created this robot lawyer, and it's actually been able to get 160,000 um, parking uh, tickets dismissed. Um, which is just amazing because if you actually look at the bot, it's pretty what, what we call a dumb bot, right? You, you, it asks you a question, you answer, it goes to the next question, and, and it answers. Um, and what's kind of cool now is that he's actually taking sort of this concept and using it um, to go after other things that he feels um, are important. So how do we deal with homelessness? Um, how do we build, do, deal with other crisis type things um, that exist out there? But it is kind of neat that there is this bot out there that's helping people getting out of parking tickets. And uh, I am sure I'll be using this uh, at some point. Now, the thing is, is, of course, we get kind of wrapped up in what are these bots that are sort of cool to us, right? Because the people in this room, um, you know, we're kind of techies, you know, in some way or another. And so we kind of think like, oh, these, you know, bots that are going to be very AI-centric. Um, but what's very interesting is we're finding that there are opportunities by which we can use these conversational bots um, to talk with different kinds of, uh, of clients and people out there. So a good example here is that uh, we, there's actually a bot that is being worked on um, that engages with farmers in Kenya. And the interesting thing is, is that it wasn't like they had to explain to them this new language, this new dialect. Actually, what they did was they just spoke. Um, to it verbally, and then the bot would respond back um, and use the same verbiage that these farmers understood. 
And so it's kind of interesting to see that, you know, not everything is going to be this sort of crazy, tricked out AI thing, but it's going to be these very practical things. And when you think about bots and you hear me talk more about them, you'll see me focusing a lot on the practicality of these bots versus, hey, they're going to do these amazing things. But we'll talk about the amazing as well. So when we talk about conversation and what's been known as conversation as a platform, to me there's sort of three things that we need to think about. First and foremost is the people. The thing we have to remember is that if you plan on building a bot, there's a person who is going to be speaking to this bot. Now, we're you know, there's some future talks about how the bots will actually communicate with each other, and that's interesting and scary at the same time. But um, the thing I always try to tell people is, remember, there are people around this. And when you're talking about conversational UI, it's even more personal. And we'll talk about sort of the design challenges around that. The other thing is, is that there are these concepts of digital assistants. Um, you probably know them as Siri, um, Cortana, um, Alexa, and they've become these really interesting things because more and more we're beginning to rely on them, right? So like, for example, um, when I go into my office uh, in my house, um, I go, hey, you know who? Um, turn on all the lights, and then the lights automatically turn on. Hey, you know who? What's, you know, what's uh, the next appointment that I have to go to? Hey, you know who? What's the weather? And, and things like that. And these digital assistants are becoming more and more ingrained in, in, their, in our lives. And when it came to sort of this conversational UI and bots, you know, I was curmudgingly like everybody else is pretty much on Twitter, right? Which was, you know, uh, okay, yeah, I get it. This sounds pretty interesting, but, you know, I don't know if this is really going to take off or not. But then I was listening to a podcast, and uh, this gentleman was talking about uh, his, uh, his little girl, and I think she was around five or six. And he spoke about the meltdown she had had the night before. And the reason why she had ha had this meltdown is because mom and dad would not let her take her best friend Alexa to bed with her. Because what she wanted to do, she wanted to take Alexa there and still have conversations and talk to her best friend. And it was one of those things where when I hear about like five-year-olds wanting to hang out with Alexa, I'm like, okay, there's something here, right? Um, and so I think that, you know, it's, it, we will see that like digital assistants will become more and more interesting. Then there's this sort of third part to conversation as a platform which is the actual bots themselves. And so when I think of bots, I think of actually something smaller. I think of something very specific to getting something done. And this is very much like we saw with apps on uh, mobile devices, right? Where you know, we were used to on the desktop of having these huge monolithic apps that did everything. And then we got to the point where we had very specific apps doing very specific things for us. So conceptually, the way that I like to think about it is that you know, human language is the new UI. And we'll talk about sort of why that is now. We've actually had you know, human language for a long time. We've had dictation and things like that. But I'll talk a little bit more about how it's a, a little different now and allows us to do some interesting things. Now, what I have started seeing is this phrase, bots are the new apps. And you can actually see I actually crossed it out um, because one is I felt that by calling them the new apps, it automatically starts this binary view of apps versus bots. And I have seen this thing happen before, right? For those of you who have doing web and then those of you doing apps. And for some reason, we believe that they are not um, alike, that they are diametrically opposed. And so we got into all of these ridiculous, dumb arguments on social about, oh, you know, well, you know, apps are so much better than web apps. And then the web apps are like, no, because you can't do this, right? And we're fighting against each other. People who are, you know, selling us ads are making a lot of money because they're like, hey, did you hear that the web is dead? And it's like, oh, I'm surprised because I keep using it every day. It doesn't seem like it's dying, right? It's not as, you know, if you, you could maybe think of it as a zombie, but it's probably not. So 
the, what I'd love for you to do is to, you know, not get dogmatic about it, but really just think in terms of bots are going to help people achieve things. And so what we will find is, is that a lot of the way we think about apps and the way we build web apps there's a lot of that that's in bots as well. So that learning and things that you've been doing so far are just going to accumulate to allowing you to do some really interesting things with, uh, with bots. And then we are seeing digital assistants as being sort of those meta apps, right? So when we talk to um, our digital assistants, um, we're seeing that they're able to handle a lot more things. So for example, when I say, hey, you know who, to my uh, machine here, um, what, what she does is she will, she, you know, I can say, hey, schedule an appointment for this date um, and at this time with these notes. And she'll go ahead and do that and tell me, hey, do you think this is okay? Um, and uh, it works out great because now what's happening is these meta apps are talking to these other apps that are in the system or online. And then I think really when we start getting into what's going to be interesting about bots is that we're going to see that intelligence starts to get infused into all of the interactions that we have. And so we'll talk a bit about sort of what does that intelligence look like today and what we think it's going to be tomorrow. So when I think of, hey, are bots just basically choose-your-own-adventure books? By the way, who, who remembers the choose-your-own-adventure books? Oh, those were awesome. I loved every single one of them, except for I would always read and I would die. So there was, I was out that one, you know, that one scary page where it'd be like, do you want to walk through the door? I would go, of course I want to walk through the door. And it'd be like, you fell into an abyss and you're falling forever. And I'd be like, I'm only eight years old. I shouldn't be reading these things. But what's good is that the bots are starting to move away from that um, and to be more about conversational UI and intelligence. And I really think this is going to be the differentiator in the bots that are very successful um, and those that are just kind of mediocre. So the thing is, when you build out a presentation about bots, there's two pictures you're always going to have to show, and this is one of them. Because immediately what happens, and this is why you're starting to see the hype around bots, is that we immediately go to what we think it could possibly be. So what happens is, is that when you start talking about bots, especially, again, if you're on the socials, everyone will begin to think of this, right? OS1 from the movie Her. How many of you all saw the movie Her? How many of y'all, it was kind of a freak out when you were watching that? Yeah, yeah, he, he's a great actor, by the way. Like, I totally believe that he was, you know, who he was. Um, but yeah, a lot of people believe what they see in Hollywood. And we saw this as well when it came to touch interfaces, right? Because what happened is when touch interfaces became a thing, immediately everybody was like, oh, we're going to be like Tom Cruise and we'll be moving things around, right? And then, of course, the naysayers would be like, but you know what's going to happen is everyone's going to get too tired from touching things. Like their arms, you know, they're just going to be dragging. And the thing is, we found that most people acclimated, right? And again, going back to the five-year-old, we've seen that acclimation before, right? When it came to touch things. It's amazing how what happens is when you put a tablet in front of a small child, they know how to interact with it. Now, they may interact with it like a monkey and just be like, <laughs> and just touching things until something happens. But you're also seeing where, you know, for, I always use the example where I went to visit a friend, um, has this really big, huge screen television. Um, and his little daughter, what do you think happened? She was eating peanut butter jelly sandwich, had the peanut butter jelly sandwich hands. She looks at the, you know, the, the TV across the room, and she's like, Dora. And she just lumbers, right? And then, you know, and I'm just laughing because I know what's about to happen, you know. And then it's like, boom, sticky fingers, sticky fingers all over. And so the thing is, touch absolutely was something that we thought, well, not a lot of people are going to want to be doing this all the time. And it turns out people didn't. They acclimated to it. So when we think of the hype, we've got to say, you know what, let's take it into consideration. Because, for example... There was a time where we talked about a service where, hey, you know what? It's only going to give you 140 characters. And we were like, what? Who wants to talk in 140 character spurts? 
Turns out a lot. Who wants a phone with no apps? You know, this thing just has a certain set of apps and only has a browser. What kind of phone would anybody want from there? Then we heard about this thing called the iPhone. Then we asked ourselves, hey, there's a service where people just snap pictures of what they're eating? And we, we think that that's interesting? And guess what? I am one of those weird people that if you do have a nice salad, I'll actually hit a favorite on it. Or if you're barbecuing and you put something on the grill, I'll probably favor it. But what we found was that a lot of people who thought originally, like, why would we do this? These are the same people who are saying those things now about bots and going, oh, these bots are dumb. This is ridiculous. You know? And of course, you've always got that, you know, that old school real developer who's like, back in the day, I already built these kind of things. And you know what? It turns out that uh, I did it in binary. I only had a zero and a one. And I just did it like this, right? And it's like, yes, understand. But guess what? Technology builds on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> the other thing is, <laughs> we're going to have really crappy bots. This has been done before, right? When the app stores came out, we had the flatulence apps. Websites. Do you remember some of the hideous websites? Those hideous websites still exist, don't they? We're going to have that with bots. There are bots you're going to look at, and you're going to be like, this is, this is supposed to be the future. And the thing is, is that, yes, this is kind of how it works. We will go through this process. We will find that some of these bots are absolutely going to suck. But what we have to do is we have to persevere because there are going to be good ones that we find. And, you know, at the end of the day, aren't we all kind of like this cat? This is like one of my favorite memes of all time. Right, so this can be used in just about every presentation I've ever done in my life. So I'm a huge fan of Cosmos. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Anybody else a big fan of this guy? Yes, awesome. I never knew that I could have a man crush on an astrophysicist, <laughs> right? I was just like, when I watched this show, I was just like, this is amazing, and like every time I go back and watch it, I'm always finding kind of new things to, that I extract from it. And what I loved was the fact that in the very last episode of the first season of Cosmos that he did, um, he talked about astrophysicists and how they think of the world. And they said, hey, you know, we're constantly looking out at space, and we think we kind of know what space is, right? Like we look at that and go, oh, it's a quasar, and it means this, this, and this. Oh, planets are made of these compositions and, and things like that. But what's interesting is every once in a while, they get it wrong. And what happens is they don't go on to Twitter and go, ha, 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 you suck, Right? That's not what astrophysicists do. They actually have it built into the way they think about things that, you know what, we will learn new things. And we will learn that, hey, maybe the way we thought about something wasn't the way that we did it. So again, it's very easy for us to say, well, bots are all hype um, and that you know, they're not really going to be worth anything. And hey, it's just better to ignore them. But I kind of like Neil's view of the world, which is, hey, you know what? Maybe we don't know everything. Maybe we can't see into the future. But coming, you know, moving forward, we'll probably find out that these bots will be a part of our lives. Maybe we just don't really see it yet. So why now? Why, why, why are bots all of a sudden becoming, becoming interesting to people? Well, one of the things is that today, messaging and social are the top experiences across all platforms. When a platform comes out, the two things that most people focus on are social and messaging. If you look at other countries, their messaging use is way more than what we have in North America. In fact, a lot of them spend most of their time within a messaging app, and they actually don't want to jump out. I remember when Facebook split up the, the Facebook app, and then they had Facebook Messenger. And remember, we all freaked out on Twitter. And we said, oh my gosh, what a catastrophe. This is the worst thing ever. I'm never going to get on Facebook again. And what did we do? We got right back on Facebook to read our uncle's racist rants about the politicians, right? And so the thing is, is that, uh, you know, we find ourselves, you know, saying like, hey, we don't think this is the way the world works, but it ends up that messaging is becoming bigger and bigger and more important. And those millennials... Anybody out there identify as millennial? 
All right. We started watching you a lot. And what we find is you love your messaging apps. You're messaging all the time. One of my employees back there, Rami, he's a millennial. Guess what he's doing right now? He's not paying attention to me. Who's his boss? How dare he? Instead, he's on messaging apps, if you can believe it. And that's the thing is that messaging is a part of what everybody is doing now. And when you see that when new platforms come about, immediately those rise way above any other apps out there in existence. Also, all the large players are bought in. So Microsoft is totally invested in this conversational platform. You also have Google, um, who spent a lot of their, uh, their uh, I.O. Uh, summit um, or uh, conference talking about conversational UI. And then you've got even Apple, who has now started kind of dipping their toes um, in the water. And then uh, language understanding has progressed uh, considerably. Um, so we're finding out that there's a lot of these great new tools, and I'll actually talk about them. Also, conversational UI is familiar. I talked about the Kenyan farmers, and we're finding that those that folks um, are able to kind of understand, like, hey, I should be able to talk to this, and that it'll understand what I'm saying. Um, also, AI and machine learning are pretty mainstream. Um, what's happening now is in all the universities, AI and machine learning are just becoming a part of the curriculum. When we go on site uh, to the different universities, um, we give them choices like, hey, what would you like to hear about? I can tell you probably the biggest thing we want, people want to hear is about machine learning. Like we can't do enough to talk to students about machine learning. And it's becoming one of those things that when they have their resumes out, um, it is a differentiator from everybody else. And so we're going to see that becoming more and more important. And then, uh, and then these cognitive services that I'll talk about later are just definitely more accessible. A lot of this stuff that we're talking about, it's basically REST endpoints. So how should we design our bots? So you may remember there was a movie called Jurassic Park, and there was a doctor on there called Dr. Ian um, McCallum. Ian McCallum? Yeah. And basically, he said something that I thought was pretty incredible which was your scientists were so preoccupied whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. The thing is, is that we're finding that when it comes to bots, a lot of people are not thinking about if they should build them or not. They're just going, hey, let's build a bot. And they're not asking the question why they absolutely should be building that bot. And so my team actually talks to a lot of different folks. We talk to um, students, uh, we talk to startups, we talk to communities, we talk to some of the big companies here um, in Canada and some of the small, the small ones. And one of the first questions we always ask is, what is the problem you're attempting to solve with this? Because the reality is, is that if you're not trying to solve a problem or if you can't identify that, that is a pretty strong leading indicator that your bot is not going to be successful. And it's interesting because all of the things that we've learned about designing websites, it applies to bots as well. We have to do that early work. So the second slide that every bot presentation must have is a, is a, a, pres, a picture from Ex Machina. The thing is, is that today the reason why there is so much hype around bots and that it is such a, it's so disappointing is because what's happening is people are trying to treat these bots as if they were humans. And my personal belief is that if you are building a bot, it should be a bot. It should not try to be a human. These tend to fail, fail and they tend to fail spectacularly. We at Microsoft? No, because we had that problem, right? Um, but the reality is, is it is going to be very hard to convince people that this bot is a real person. And I just don't think that it's actually fair when we look at that people attribute of bots. And so I always say, don't try to be um, an actual person. Try to be a bot. And what you'll find is, is that more people will very much understand how to engage and interact if they're not thinking that it's supposed to be um, an actual person. And the funny part is I was in on a, uh, I was in a discussion uh, forum on bots. And this uh, guy, he had built this bot, and he had looked at kind of the questions people are, were asking. And he was like, you know, it's really weird because I'm looking through like what people are asking my bot. And, you know, they're, they think it's like an actual person. 
And then this person did it a very respectful way, said, yeah, I went to your website, and on your marketing page, you say, you can talk to this like it's an actual real person. <laughs> and so one of the things was like, hey, yeah, we got to make sure that not only are we not treating the bot as a person, but that we also don't market it as a person as well, that it needs to be this thing that doesn't exist. And we're actually starting to see a lot of celebrities are doing this, where what they're doing is they're creating a bot so that they can still have interaction with their fan base, but they're being very specific that, hey, you're not talking to Kylie Minogue, you know, you name whatever, whatever, uh, whatever artist you want, but that you're actually talking to the bot of the person. And you know what? Surprisingly, people are actually okay with that. The other question we always ask our clients is, how does this react in crisis? And not crisis in that, like, hey, a server is going down or, or something like that. But what if the person who is engaging your bot is in a crisis? So what happens, for example, when their servers have all gone down? Do you want a bot that's all happy? Hey, I saw that your, you know, your website is down. Hey, that's cool. We'll do something to deal with that, right? No one wants that. What you need to do is you need to make sure that you have built into the bot that if the person is having some kind of crisis, that you immediately either A, flip to getting the problem solved as quick as possible, or B, handing them off to an actual human. It's not the time to be all kind of cool and hip and funny, right? And we've seen this before, even with some of the larger um, digital assistants, that a lot of people are, get very unhappy when it turns out that it starts kind of joking with you when you're really in a pissy mood. And then just some final uh, quick ones. Um, one is, does your bot provide specific responses that lead? The worst, <laughs> the worst thing that bots do these days is the, is the uh, equivalent of when you walk up to a person, you go, hi. And they go, hi. That's pretty awkward, right? Well, it's the same thing with bots. You have to make sure that after that initial jump, what is the next thing? Does it confirm actions? So what you don't want to do is if someone says, hey, go ahead and delete you know, my account. Don't go, OK, deleted. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> close, close the browser. No. What you want to do is you want to go ahead and make sure you confirm those actions. Is it also accessible and inclusive? The thing is, we're talking a lot about text. So when we build our bots, we should make sure that it includes people who may have you know, bad eyesight, that they may have some kind of impairment. And it's something we need to think through, that it can't just be for folks um, who don't have impairments. Also, as a designer, you need to map out all the paths. This is going to be one of those things where you're going to need a huge whiteboard. Because what happens is I get very nervous when people say, hey, I'm going to go build a bot, so let me go open up my code editor. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait. Have you worked through, like, what is the bot going to say? What's the dialogues that you're going to create? And they're like, no, 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 I'll just make it up on the fly. No, you don't want to do that. You need to think through what those are. And so it might be a bunch of whiteboards. It might be a bunch of sticky notes, what have you. But you've got to make sure that you've got that, uh, that uh, set up or you'll find that you're going to run into problems. And then finally, design for humans, not yourself. One of the things I see all the time in this uh, forum that, uh, that I'm on is they will ask each other, hey, will you test out my bot? And they're the absolute wrong people to do it. Because guess what? They're all technical bot builders, right? And it's not the actual people who are going to go to the bot or go to the site. So think of that key audience before you actually turn it on others. So I'm going to go through fairly quick on how do, you actually, how do we actually go about building bots. And so the good part is, is that you have tons of choice because there's a lot of different libraries out there today. I would say the ones that sort of are kind of a big deal is the wit.ai. Um, this is used by Facebook Messenger. We also have api.ai uh, from Google. And we're seeing a whole lot of roll your own, because honestly, there weren't a whole lot of good libraries out there for people. So you'll start seeing that there's a lot there. But again, What's nice is, is that in this world, there's a ton of choice that you've got, and it's really going to be about what works for you. 
What worked for us is the bot framework because it does come from Microsoft. We have access to people who can help us out in the actual uh, product team. But what we liked about it was that it was pretty comprehensive. So for example, inside of it, it has a bot builder. Um, you can use JavaScript or you can use uh, C Sharp to, to build these out. Um, it's nice because it handles a lot of things for you. So for example, you don't have to build a date library to handle dates. It's already built into to the system. Um, you can also, all the dialogues and everything, they're on all the different messaging systems. That's already taken care of for you. And then also, too, we add things like chat emulators, and then you can plug in whatever it is you need. And that's the good part as well, is that when we built this bot framework, it actually allows you to say, hey, Maybe I don't want to use Microsoft's version of language interpretation. I want to use something else. Or I want to host it on AWS. You can absolutely go ahead and do that. Um, and then I'll talk to the uh, other things there. The good part um, with that we like about the bot framework is it's open source as well. And uh, actually fairly, doc fairly well documented. So if you go up to GitHub, you can fork it. You can uh, do pull requests against it. Um, and you can see a lot of the samples that uh, exist out there today. So it's not like you have to kind of roll it yourself and figure it out. It's actually already built in um, for you there. So feel free to go up there and grab it. The other thing I had said that we liked about it is that we support a lot of different uh, channels. So the thing is, is that you're going to have to sort of figure out what channels you want to be a part of. So a lot of folks focus on Facebook, right, especially in North America. Um, but the good part is, is that you can add things like Slack, Telegram, Twilio. You can do email. Um, you can actually have just a web chat control in your web app. And the good part is, is it's abstracted out for you. So here, for example, you can see some checkout uh, screens. So on the left, we have Facebook. And on the right, we have Skype. The good part is that you write it. And it, does, it helps you to make it look like it's in that, uh, in that platform. And that's really important, because the weirdest thing that you can have is where someone goes to your bot, and they go, oh, they must be using this tool, right? It's kind of like back in the day you know, with uh, Delphi, if you can remember that. If you ever saw a checkbox that was written in Delphi, you knew it was a Delphi app. Or when there was the original Java, Java UI components out there, you'd be like, oh, this is a Java app, or this is a Windows app, right? Because it had a very specific look, and it would try to just abstract that across all these different platforms. And with this, we actually go ahead and do the hard work there um, for you. And they keep adding more and more of these uh, channels. And so it's actually pretty easy to get started. You basically grab your code editor of choice. You can choose what you want. Um, do an npm init. Then go ahead and install bot builder through npm as well, and as well as Restify. And what you'll find again is everything's built on REST APIs. So if you ever have the question of, hey, will it work with this other thing? If that other thing has a REST API, 99% eh, of the time, it's probably going to work in one way or another. And the code that you see here is very simply just setting up the Restify service, creating the chatbot, and then having a dialogue that actually grabs, that just turns back when you say hi to it, it returns hello world. So this is kind of your quintessential bot of uh, hello world. Also, it's very easy to collect input. So what happens is someone's going to want to talk to your uh, talk to your bot, and this is the way that you can do it. So you can see here that we have a uh, dialog, and that dialog is just like you would think of um, dialog in a conversation, right? You have sort of your general conversation. So when you walk up to someone, you go, "Hey, we're about to have a conversation." That's the conversation. But within that conversation, you may talk about different things you'll create different dialogues for that. So for example, you may have a profile dialogue where it says, hey, I need to change my profile. And it goes, oh, OK, we know that you want to have this kind of conversation, and we can now work through that model. And then again, you can add all of these different functions in this what they call the waterfall method, where, hey, I say something, and then I'm going to respond back on based on what you said. And then we can manage those dialogues and those states. So the good thing is, is that if someone asks a question of, hey, what's the weather in Calgary? They, you get the answer. But the thing is, is if you ask the question typically, you know, what will be the weather there tomorrow? People get confused because they're like, what's there? 
We also have an emulator built in, so you don't have to spend a whole lot of time uh, trying to kind of see what the actual actions are going to be back and forth. Then we also have a concept of intents, and then intents basically is what are the activities that your bot is going to engage in. So for example, um, if you're building a lifestyle app, you might say, hey, I want to start my run. Well, that's an intent to start your run, and you'll kind of build out these kind of conversational pieces that we call intents. And then, of course, you can publish it to our bot framework service, but you can use, again, totally your own. Um, we also support uh, Visual Studio Code uh, debugging. So if you actually want to debug your bot in real time, you can actually do that with Visual Studio Code. And again, Visual Studio Code is for free. Um, it's a free install, works on Mac, Linux, and uh, the PC. And then finally, you can actually put your bot up in our bot directory. But again, if you want to use something else, that's fine. But what's nice here is that not only do you get sort of a page that you can kind of work with it at, but you can also, for example, there's an embedded uh, web uh, version of the uh, conversation. So you can actually test it out there. And then you can also add all your different channels here. And then you can even really quickly turn on um, analytics as well. So if you want to get analytics for your chatbot, you don't have to roll your own. It's already there. And then we actually uh, use uh, Language Understanding Intelligence Service, Lewis. Um, and this is what we use to help with the conversational pieces. Um, so for example, um, you may be building a, a, a pizza delivery system. And someone might say, hey, can you deliver three large pepperoni pizzas to my crib? Well, the thing is, you may not know, or I would say your bot may not know what my crib means. So you can actually go in as someone who doesn't know, um, you know anything about deep learning and language uh, parsing, and you could select my crib and say, ah, that's actually the location. That would be, assume, the house. And you can tweak this model, and this model learns based on the other uh, big projects that are out there that are taking in uh, data like this. And so it's very easy to kind of get that natural language. And again, you don't have to do the work. So for example, you can actually have Urban Dictionary actually be in the background of this so that if people are using terms in Urban Dictionary um, with your bot, your bot will understand what do, what do those actually mean. So where can we go from here? Because basically I told you that you shouldn't be building bots, right? That, you know, guess what? Don't build a bot unless you've really done all the work. And that, you know, bots, should, we shouldn't think of them as AI, right? We shouldn't think of them as, the, you know, her and, you know, or Scarlett Johansson um, as, as, as a part of what bots are really about. But I would say that there's some unique things because guess what we're doing now? We're starting to actually put things like cognitive services and making them available um, to our bots. So for example, there's an emotion API that's a part of these cognitive services. So remember I told you before, what do we do in crisis? Well, you can actually figure out what is the emotion of the person. So for example, if someone comes to your bot and your bot says hi and they go, hey asshole, my website's down. You're not gonna go, we're so glad to be of service to you and we really appreciate your business. No, you can go, wow, the emotion API is telling me this person's very angry. Maybe what we do is we go, hey, would you like to talk to a human now? Maybe that's what we do. So we've got these great cognitive service APIs. And I wanted to show you an example of, uh, of one of the researchers who actually put a lot of these cognitive services that are available to your bots into an actual physical medium. And so go ahead, we'll go ahead and watch this. I'm Sakib Sheikh. I lost my sight when I was seven, and shortly after that, I went to a school for the blind. And that's where I was introduced to talking computers, and that really opened up a whole new world of opportunities. I joined Microsoft 10 years ago as a software engineer. I love making things which improve people's lives. And one of the things I've always dreamt of since I was at university was this idea of something that could tell you at any moment what's going on around you. I think it's a man jumping in the air doing a trick on a skateboard. I teamed up with like-minded engineers to make an app which lets you know who and what is around you. 
It's based on top of the Microsoft Intelligence APIs, which makes it so much easier to make this kind of thing. The app runs on smartphones, but also on the Pivot Head smart glasses. When you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk and there's no response and you think, is everyone listening really well? Or are they half asleep? And you never know. I see two faces, 40 year old man with a beard looking surprised, 20 year old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon. Here's your menu. Great, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document. And then it'll recognize the text. Read me the headings. I see appetizers, salads, paninis, pizzas, pastas. Years ago, this was science fiction. I never thought it would be something that you could actually do. But artificial intelligence is improving at an ever faster rate. And I'm really excited to see where we can take this. Hey. As engineers, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants, building on top of what went before. And in this case, we've taken years of research from Microsoft Research to pull this off. I think it's a young girl throwing an orange frisbee in the park. For me, it's about taking that far-off dream and building it one step at a time. I think this is just the beginning. And what I love about that is the fact that, it's like you said, it's not science fiction. All the things that you saw in there, you can actually do today with your bots. And so there's all these different APIs that, that exist out there that allow you to take a picture and for the picture to be described as to, hey, what is it that, that you're looking at? Um, those emotion APIs, they're even looking at people's facial um, features and saying, hey, is this person happy or are, are they sad? Um, and you can think maybe that's a bit creepy, but uh, there is some kind of uh, greatness to what we see in the future for, uh, for chatbots. So there's three places that I'm going to tell you to check out if you're still interested in building out bots. One is chatbotsmagazine.com. This is just a great uh, medium collection of uh, great, uh, great thoughtfulness around people building out chatbots. So if you're looking at designing them or you're an entrepreneur, this is where I would absolutely tell you to go and check out because you'll find some amazing write-ups of people thinking about these things and thinking about not only what it is today, but what's going on in the future. If you're actually looking to build something, go to broadframework.com, um, and you can also reach out to me. I'll show you my, uh, my contact information if you're interested, and I can uh, absolutely help answer any questions. And then also on Facebook, there is a bots group. It's literally called Bots. Um, it's pretty amazing. You basically tell them you want to join, and they'll let you join. It's a private thing, but they'll still let anyone if they'll let me in. Um, but what's great is you hear other bot builders and creators and thinkers talking back and forth to each other. And so it's kind of a nice little um, you know, way to kind of figure out like, hey, what are people thinking about? And what, does, what does it matter to them? So with all this said, I know that we had 45 minutes to just basically go through everything um, that's related to bots and conversational UI. Um, I think that it is a very interesting time that we're in. We're definitely not in the maturity phase of this. We're still in that learning phase, but I think it's becoming very interesting because we are starting to see those, um, we're seeing those opportunities that, guess what? Yeah, people do gravitate towards these conversational UIs. Conversation is getting easier based on the technologies that we have. And now we have all of these things that we didn't have before, right? We didn't have these cognitive things that we all have when we actually have conversations with each other. And now those are available to us. So it's this really kind of amazing opportunity to maybe say, hey, we've had all these different type of interaction models. Now we have a new one that's on our plate that we can use. So with that, I know we're out of time, so I want to say thank you very much. And again, if you want to talk about bots, I'll be hanging around uh, afterwards. You can also email me, um, and then, of course, you can uh, hit me up on uh, Twitter uh, at, at Tommy Lee. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.